beat to my own drum. My parents both always encouraged me to dream. I definitely had an imagination that knew no bounds. And my parents made a conscious decision to never tell us no to our dreams. My mom recognized I had artistic abilities at a very young age, and she enrolled me in art classes. And no matter how crazy our imagination was, I remember my mom would just go with it. I don't remember a time when I didn't feel like I had permission to dream, to create, and imagine. And I, I have to say that's all because of my parents. The most important times in my life are the times that I failed, especially when it comes to making your dreams come true. It's what fuels you. When your gas tank is empty, it's that failure that gives you the energy to fill up your gas tank to keep trying. I definitely took steps to make my passion turn into dream come true, but a lot of it just happened because I was open to it, because I put myself in situations that presented the opportunities. When I found out that I was cast as the voice of the Silvatano, my mind was blown, because for so long I was typecast as the mean girl, and for once, I was cast as the hero and the good guy. I don't think I ever thought, no, I can't do this. I thought, this moment is made for me, and I'm not going to miss it. And I'm not a confident person. If you're my friend, if you know me in life, I'm not confident. In that moment, I wasn't going to let the fear of never having done it before stop me from something that was so deeply ingrained in my being, my creative existence. I believe that everyone was given their own unique skills and talents to make their dream come true. Yes, those are the building blocks for success, but hard work is also part of that. For me, I think my new dream is sharing with others that their dreams can come true too. The most exciting part about where I'm at now in my career and in this position of voicing is now so it's known and loved by so many and represents so much is that I get to act as an ambassador now to help other people who have their dreams. I just want to encourage everyone possible to voice their dreams. It gives yourself permission to, to do it, to be it, to believe it. It just starts with the first step. You have to voice your dreams. your dreams, once you say it out loud, I mean, in the words of Open One, you've taken your first step into a much larger world. Now, please welcome to the stage your dream duo, Ashley Eckstein and Fred Island. But um, very graciously, 
Um, somebody took the time to respond to my letter. Seven-year-old Brett, you know, please, sir, may I have a job? This uh, person took the, the time to respond to me, and he sent this very thorough letter that outlined um, tons of advice on how to pursue a career in Disney animation. He, he mentioned schools to go to. He mentioned books to read. He encouraged me to draw every day. And you know, I cherished that letter as a child. I, this was like my roadmap to success, my roadmap to my dream. Um, and so I did. I, I, I drew as much as I could. I read all the books. I chose an art school after graduating high school that was known to have a relationship with Disney. So I was on the path to be that Disney animator. Well, Disney traditional animation kind of stopped um, right after I started school. And so I kind of had to shift gears and my artistic um, view, vantage point, had opened up quite a bit. So I was interested in a few other visual arts careers. But um, yeah, and I never lost sight of that dream work for Disney. So I was actually, through some uh, different portfolio uh, meetings, was offered an unpaid internship with Disney Imagineering. But at the same time, I was offered a job with Hallmark Greeting Cards. Um, well, I took the Hallmark Greeting Cards job because it was a salary position. <laughs> it was a little, you know. Smart decision. Yeah, after dropping a ton of money in college, you kind of want to be able to pay for it. So I did that, um, and I was there for five years and had a wonderful time. Uh, but at the end of five years, I was getting a little creatively stir crazy. And um, just coincidentally, that is when I got an email that kind of changed my course. Um, the email was from a friend of mine who works at Pixar, went to school with me, and she forwarded me an internal email that Disney had sent around, and the subject line said, do you want to be the voice of Mickey Mouse? I kid you not. I mean, how many of you received emails like that, right? Mm. Um, thankfully, it did not go to my spam folder, so... Oh my gosh, what could have been? Can you imagine? Oh. Yeah. I never thought about that. Yeah. Let's take a minute to reflect on. Um, <laughs> moral of the story: always check your spam folder. Yeah, <laughs> filters, people. If there's one thing you walk away from, it's check your email filters. <laughs> or walk away from this presentation with is check. Oh my gosh, day three. How about it? Who's who's <laughs> it? stories, look at me hogging the entire presentation. Got the email, it out outlined the audition process. I took a chance of doing something I'd never done before, which was voice acting. Submitted my audition, and long story short, here I am, 12 years later, voicing the iconic Mickey Mouse, and I couldn't be happier that I took that chance um, when fate had you know, presented me with the opportunity. And I think it's important to note that you were not an actor. You had done a little no. bit of theater in high school, but you were not an actor, and you could have said, oh gosh, no, I, I can't, you know, send in an audition, I'm not an actor, but you took a chance. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, that's what we've talked about a lot in, in forming this presentation is, is the risk taking and the chances that we've, we've both taken in our careers to get here. Um, and, and that's why we talk about this notion of dreams, right? Like, your dreams often involve some sort of chance um, or, or risk, and um, you know, I, I never really considered myself to be one to take risks, but in this moment, I knew that in order to even have a shot at this dream, I had to take a chance, and I'm so glad I did. Now, you we're such good friends, I know, of course, that it's always been a dream of yours to be an actress. Um, but how does the dream of being an actress take us to voicing an iconic Star Wars character like Ahsoka Tano? Well, Brett and I initially bonded. The first time we met, we started talking about the Mickey Mouse Club. So, oh, actually, on the next slide. Oh, sorry, um, Jeremy, we changed the presentation today, and he's <laughs> missing our cues because we didn't tell him. <laughs> no, everyone uh, say thank you, Jeremy. Jeremy's been running. Uh, <laughs> our dream vision board. So up there you'll see the logo for the Mickey Mouse Club. And Brett and I first bonded over the Mickey Mouse Club. He was like the West Coast version of me as a kid. Yep. He grew up at Disneyland, I grew up at Disney World, and we both fell in love with the Mickey Mouse Club. And you know, unlike Brett, where he wanted to be an artist, I knew from an early age that I wanted to be an actress. Um, my neighbor worked for the Mickey Mouse Club. I got to go to a taping, a live taping of the Mickey so Mouse jealous. Club. 
Yeah, it was really cool. And from that moment, I knew hook, line, and sinker. That's what I wanted to do. And so, um, started acting as a young kid. As soon as I was old enough, I, I took that risk, took that chance and moved to LA, because um, that's where they filmed all the shows on the Disney Channel. And that was truly my dream, was to just be an actress on the Disney Channel. And um, so at 19, I moved to LA, and I was fortunate enough, because I was 19, but I legitimately looked 13. Uh, and still does, right? <laughs> oh, thanks, but, um, but I was able to get a role on That So Raven. Has anyone ever seen That So Raven? <laughs> I promise I'm not mean like my character. Um, but she sounded a little like this. She said, Alana said that she likes Pensacon. Um, so she talked like that. Um, she's very annoying, but very funny. Um, so I was mostly an on-camera actress. I, you know, that's what a lot of people don't realize. You know, they think of me as a voice actress, but pretty much my entire career is in film and television. But growing up in Orlando, Florida, I fell in love with the Disney princesses. And it was always my dream to, to be a Dis the voice of a Disney princess. And so I asked my agents if they would send me out on voiceover auditions too. Well, thankfully, I, I, my voice sounded really young, and so they agreed, um, but I, I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> you know, it, I, I, I went on about four years of auditions before I was eventually cast as the voice of Ahsoka. So just to put some numbers behind that, four years of auditions is equal to about 400 auditions that I did not get. <laughs> I was rejected. A lot of no's. A lot of no's. In fact, I was even cast twice um, as, as a lead character in the series, and then I was recast which happens quite a bit, but it's... All too often, and it hurts. It's heartbreaking. And so I share all of this because by the time I got the audition for Star Wars The Clone Wars, it was four years into auditioning, I was, I was tired, I'm not gonna lie. I, you know, I was a little down on my voiceover abilities. And I showed up to the audition, um, and I walked out right away. Um, because there was, it, it seemed like a hundred other actresses in there, and I was auditioning for the role of Padma. I was not auditioning for the role of Ahsoka. And I knew that I sounded nothing like Padme. And so I walked out of the audition, I called my agent, and I said, look, they're running behind, there's a ton of actresses, I don't sound anything like Padme, I think I'm gonna leave. And I'm normally a really positive person, but um, that day I was just really down on myself. No. He said, turn around and go back inside because you never know what could happen. And so sure enough, I went back in. Um, this is my first time in life. They stopped me. I remember Dave Filoni stopped me and he was like, no, you sound nothing like Padme. <laughs> but they said, there's this new character that no one knows about. It's a 14 year old girl and we think you might be perfect for her. And so, thankfully, they let me read for, I didn't even know it was for the role of Ahsoka. Um, they let me read for the role of Ahsoka, and um, I was so excited, and then instantly dreams dashed again, because they wanted Ahsoka to have an Icelandic accent. Um, I couldn't do an Icelandic accent. <laughs> Somehow I got called back, but I practiced my Icelandic accent before the callback. Like, I mastered it. And I walked in, and I did the first Should I put time. you on the spot to do an Icelandic accent okay. right now? <laughs> you absolutely do. I don't, I don't know. If, if, would anybody here know what an Icelandic accent sounds like? Because... Well, the thing is, so, okay, I, I'm not going to do it because I, I, I literally can't do it. Like, I was so bad at it. But Icelandic, pure Icelandic sounds Irish. Um, so that's what I did. I said a line where it was Irish, which I can't even remember. It's like, welcome to the Clone Wars. <laughs> I don't even know, it's so bad. It's so bad, you guys. And so, um, anyway, so I'm in this audition, and uh, I say the first line in Icelandic, which was good at the time. Um, it sounded like Irish. And Dave Maloney stopped me. And he said, um, can, can you do it more Icelandic? 
Because he thought that this pseudo-Irish accent was just typical Ashley. Yeah. Well, so then, okay, one thing I would never do, I'm, I'm very polite, I was raised in the South, but I talked back to the director, which is something you don't do. But I was so frustrated because I wanted this role so bad. I raised my hand and I said, I'm sorry, I am doing Icelandic. I don't know what you want. That got me the role. <laughs> I don't think this is a piece of advice you should give. No, but I lucked out because the soda, as many of you know, is snippy. Well, they were looking for someone that was snippy. So, long story short, I ended up booking the role, and I was dumbfounded. I'm like, how did I get this role after I talked back to the director? And uh, thankfully, they said, we don't want her to do an Icelandic accent. <laughs> Whew. They said, but we want her to just use her own voice. And fortunately, because I was myself in the audition, Dave Filoni cast me to just be myself for the role of Ahsoka. And so Ahsoka, as we know her today, she says, I'm no Jedi. Very different than I say <laughs> That's true. No, Fred. Okay, so um, I know, again, as your friend, you are the voice of Mickey Mouse, but you didn't give up your dream to be a Disney artist. So you are more than just the voice of Mickey. Tell us how you'd be able, how you were able to become a Disney artist. Yeah, well, you know, for me it was really important because art, my passion for art, never went away. Um, you know, and and yeah, here I was. I landed this amazing job at the Disney company that I never imagined. Um, and I like to say, really, being the voice of Mickey Mouse, I have the best vantage point of everything happening at Disney. Because whereas I was interested in animation, and there was a period where I wanted to be an Imagineer, and I wanted to work at the theme parks, I get to work on all of that now. I'll go into the studio, one day I'm recording a TV show, the next day I'm recording a toy for consumer products, uh, the next day I'm recording a show for the theme parks, for the cruise line, and so I've got to meet people from across all the different departments at Disney, which is amazing. Um, but I never lost that desire to do art. Um, and, and here I was, I thought, Excuse me. I thought I have the chance now to potentially do artwork for Disney, and 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 through those people I've met, actually, I've gotten, I've maintained a freelance art career, and I've I've gotten to work on projects for Walt Disney Imagineering, um, for different theme park merchandise programs for D23. Ash and I are working on some stuff together. Yeah. Stay tuned. Um, but yes, um, to answer your question about Disney Fine Art, that was one of the first things I actually reached out to somebody about. I said, I know there's this publishing wing of Disney, Disney Fine Art. I would love to do Mickey art. And they were, of course, well, I shouldn't say of course. They, they saw the potential. I think, of course they said, of course. His art is amazing. Oh. So definitely Google Brett Island Disney Fine Art, and your mind is going to be blown. Thank you. Um, but yeah, they they took me up on that 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 ask, and and I was able to be a published Disney artist, and I've done several paintings. Uh, most recently, I started doing a silkscreen series, just because that was kind of more my style, my uh, my love of national parks, etc. Plays into that. So um, yeah, I I've been so lucky to to not only voice Mickey, but now draw him in professional. Uh, setting and, and you know so much that harkens back to my love of Walt, my fascination of Walt. And, you know, here was this guy who, yes, created the iconic Mickey Mouse as we know him, but went on to create so much else. Um, and something you and I talk about a lot is just this the the desire to to stay creative and to never stop growing and learning. And that's really, I think, what at an early age I gravitated towards in Walt's story was this. Um, you know, curiosity that kept him dreaming and doing and creating. Um, and you put it perfectly earlier when we were talking today, how Walt had the ability to bring out the best in people. You know, he was somebody who knew how to leverage the creatives that were working with him in a way that maybe they didn't even realize at the time. And, they, you know, but he brought out that little spark that was just enough to, to make the project go above and beyond. Um, so, you know, Walt has just always been such an inspiration to me, and to this day I'm always thinking about, you know, especially voicing Mickey, who is essentially Walt, you know, Mickey and Walt are, are one and the same, um, and uh, so I'm always reminded of that, but, you know, one quote that <laughs> has stuck with me of Walt's 
um, and actually terrified me in college. I would go to Disney World and there was a little exhibit on Walt and they'd play a video and they'd play this quote and you know, Walt says, and this isn't verbatim, but he said, you know, I believe everybody needs to have a good heart failure in their life. And I remember, you know, being 17, 18 at the time, watching this, I thought, God, I don't want a failure. I don't want to fail, that sounds miserable. But, you know, I have since learned and experienced several failures and you realize that those failures are really the thing that give you the power to keep going. You know, the power to dream a little bigger, a little brighter. Uh, now, of course, again, because we're such good friends, I know that you are encountered, you encountered a failure, you know, and tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, I deemed it as a failure. Uh, so, as I mentioned, I knew at a young age that I was bit by the acting bug. I knew that I wanted to be an actress, and I had other interests. I had interests, I wanted to be a fashion designer, I wanted to be all of these other things, but I had a teacher at school tell me, you have to pick one. You can't become an actress and also do all of these other things, and I believed her. So even though you know, I willingly picked acting, and that was truly my passion, and and, uh, but I still, I kind of gave up all of my other desires and solely focused on acting. Well, eventually, I had to move to Toronto, Canada. Uh, my husband used to play baseball and he signed with the Toronto Blue Jays and when I, I needed to go with him. And when I went to Canada, I couldn't work there as an actress. Because, because you didn't have a Canadian accent. <laughs> yeah, because you didn't have a Canadian accent. No, I didn't have a work visa. And oh. if you don't have a work visa, you're not allowed to work there. Um, and so here I was sitting in Canada and I remember I was sitting on my couch and all of a sudden I got calls and all of my agents and managers dropped me. Um, here I was, I had a pretty successful acting career, but since I couldn't be in LA and I couldn't go to auditions, they literally said if you're not in LA, you're not auditioning and you're not making us money, and if you're not making us money, you're no good to us. And literally overnight, I went from having a successful acting career to what I felt nothing. And so fortunately, um, it wasn't out yet. I, I still was the voice of the Sokotano, but nobody even knew about Star Wars and Clone Wars yet. So I didn't know if it was going to be successful. I didn't know if people were going to like Star Wars. But here I was sitting on my couch with nothing. I felt like my dream had been ripped away. I felt that everything that I worked for was gone in an instant. But I didn't want to give up. And so instead of looking at what I didn't have, I focused my attention on what I did have. And I thought, okay, I do have Star Wars, and I have a laptop, and I have a cell phone. What can I do with those three things? And that's when I got the original idea of Her Universe. So my company, Her Universe, is a merchandise line for female fans. And um, I thought, you know what? There's a lot of us female fans out there, and they weren't making Star Wars clothes made for us. And so after doing my research, I realized that it didn't exist. And in June 2010, I actually opened up uh, my company, Her Universe, uh, on heruniverse.com, and we went around to conventions. But I share this story because Her Universe would not exist today if I didn't have that good, hard failure. And to me, it, it, I, I, I was at a crossroads. I could have completely given up and just said, wow, it's, it's all gone and, and not done anything else. But instead, I was like, I've come too far. I'm not going to give up, but I'm going to focus, I'm going to shift my mindset and focus on what I do have. Yeah. And so here we are today. Uh, you know, and I, I know I've met a lot of you who have come up and said very kind things and you've supported her universe over all these years. So I want to thank you so much. Well, I think, I think there's a lot of people here who would be saying thank you to you for deciding to go with that market and, you know, that was thank you. Um, Great, we can go to the next slide. We would like to welcome you all to the official Voice Your Dreams Club. Brett designed a very cool card. You want to talk about it? Uh, it's a card and it's cool. Um, <laughs> and hopefully you received it when you came in. So, yeah, here. Do what you will with that, but we, we just kind of thought it'd be fun to leave you guys with something you could take away and hopefully it can be a reminder to you or, or if you know somebody else who maybe, you know, needs the encouragement to pursue their dreams, feel free to pass it on. But, you know, ultimately that's what Ashley and I are, are passionate about is just inspiring others 
with our stories. Well, we love being each other's hype friends. Yes. I call myself a Brett Island hype friend, and he's the same for me. So next time you're thinking, should I do this? Should I go for it? Should I take that risk? Hopefully you'll look at that card and turn it over on the back where it says this card grants you permission to, you know, to voice your dreams. Hopefully you'll you'll allow us to be your hype friends and um, the card will encourage you to go for it. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I think we have about 15 minutes left. If you guys have any questions, we'd love to yeah, take the remainder of that time to, uh, to answer questions because I know there's probably a lot. Mine was heavier, just for the record. Can you do the Mickey Mouse laugh? Uh -huh. <laughs> or did you want a longer one? Just the experience of drawing every day is going to teach yourself things about yourself, your own artistic style. You're going to start absorbing more around you. And, you know, it's just like any other skill set. The more you do it, the better you're going to be at it. So anyone who's looking to be an artist, I would just say draw every day and take in as much inspiration as you can. What's your favorite Clone Wars episode? That is a great question. Um, uh, I, I, I do love, even though it's very sad, I love the season five finale. Um, even though it makes me cry every time. Um, but I also love the Mortis trilogy. It's one that I feel like doesn't get a lot of love. Because um, Ahsoka goes to the dark side, we see older Ahsoka. She dies in that, and then comes back to life. A lot happens. Well, <laughs> oh. geez, you're not a very good hype friend, Brett. <laughs> um, but I will tell you this. My favorite Ahsoka quote from um, Star Wars The Clone Wars is in the final season 
where she says, in my life, when you find people who need your help, you help them, no matter what. I guess it's just who I am. And I love that quote from the final season, and pretty much everything from the final season. <laughs> hardworking people, but how much of your success would you contribute to hard work versus luck or being in the right place at the right time? Great question. Good, good question that we're both very passionate about. Um, I, I don't even know where to start with that. Um, I think each of us would agree, and I'll let Ashley answer for herself, but um, you know, there's been a lot of hard work behind um, behind where we are now. Um, and it's very, because we're so excited about what we do, you know, it, it's, it's, it's cooler to talk about the fun times, right? The, and, the, and to celebrate the success. Um, but all, don't get me wrong, all of that came with a lot of hard work. And that's not me trying to pat ourselves on the back. You know, it's just the reality of it. Um, you know, I think being open to the opportunities uh, is key. Um, and, and yes, you know, I, I share the story about how I open my laptop and I get this email out of nowhere, but opening that email was just the tip of the iceberg for a very long journey of auditioning um, and, and honestly learning. I mean, like the minute I was cast as Mickey, it wasn't done. Um, I took, a, I did a deep dive and I already knew, trust me, I knew Mickey. I knew my shorts, I knew his history. But um, I, I went back and I did a deep dive into all of the old classic shorts, um, everything from Plain Crazy Steamboat Willie on, just to re-familiarize myself with what are Mickey's attributes, what are his character traits. Um, and, and not having been a voice actor before, um, you know, similar to how Ashley said she likes to learn by doing, I'm the same way. I, 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 find, it hard, I find it hard to focus in a classroom, but Put me out of skill, and I will I will tackle anything. So I think um, you know I like to think that I'm still growing and still learning, and I think you just have to be open to that the work. Uh, I'm taking too long. So. <laughs> no, no, it was, it's great. And to piggyback on that, I actually really, really dislike the term overnight success because I don't believe anyone's really an overnight success, and it's a term that is used all the time, and especially to the kids in here, there's no such thing as an overnight success. Behind every person that they call an overnight success is actually someone that worked really, really hard to get there, and they didn't give up. And they may be deemed an overnight success because that's the first time that you've heard about them, but, you know, the two of us, <laughs> I've been as an, act an actress in L.A. for over 20 years, and, um, and then before that, as a kid, and you know, there's thousands of auditions that I went on that I didn't get. And you just happened to see the couple of them that I did get. And so, um, just don't give up. And I also want to add, um, don't be afraid to ask questions and be curious. I often say the difference between someone that makes their dream come true and someone that doesn't is the person that does, they're not afraid to just ask questions. You know, especially ask questions of someone that's done it before, that, that, that they're doing what you want to do. Because they got there because somebody helped them. And so they want to pay it forward. And so don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Just be curious and say yes. Because one thing leads to another. Again, I think a lot of times your passion will speak for itself. And if you are authentic in your passion, um, and that comes across, you know, you, you often hear that confidence is attractive, right? Um, and sometimes that means acting the part when you're not so much feeling it. But similar to, you know, what you mentioned about asking for help, I think just if, you, if that passion is genuine behind what you're pursuing, then people will recognize that, and, and hopefully doors will, you know, kind of open for you. Uh, but, yeah. Well, for those of you who don't know, I, you know, when I started years ago, it was a lot easier for me to define what essentially I work on. Sometimes people are like, well, does Mickey talk? What's he talking? Well, he talks in a lot of stuff. And I quickly learned that. 
Um, and I used to be able to say, I am the voice of Mickey, I talk, anytime you hear him talk, it's me. Well, more accurately now, if you watch the new Mickey Mouse shorts, um, I do not voice Mickey in those. So I, I would say that's probably the newest Mickey, right? Um, and the reason I don't is just simply, at the time those were created, they were trying to find a new version of Mickey, right? They wanted to go a little off uh, skew of what we knew. And so, me being new to the scene and voicing Mickey the way he had been voiced for 80 something years up to that point wasn't what they were looking for. And so they went with somebody else. Um, and since you asked, I feel like I have permission to share my opinion. Um, yeah, you know, I think when I look back at, and I've heard a lot of people say, well, it's fun to see Mickey like he used to be. Um, and make no mistake, Mickey in the early shorts was a little bit more zany, right? He got himself into trouble. He was a little, uh, you know, a little bit more rascally than maybe the the good old boy that he became in the in the 40s and 50s. But I, I want to say that for me, there's a big difference between being a little a little bit more zany and being a jerk. <laughs> and and I think Mickey, you know, his at his core, he is loyal, he is steadfast, and he is a leader. And even though he may get frustrated, he is an optimist, and as Walt said, he is an every man. And who can't relate to those qualities, right? Um, so for me, um, when I look back at the old Mickey, I think we have to honor his evolution. And, and we have to acknowledge that just like we as people change and grow, Mickey's changed and grown. And you know, I, when I think of Mickey, I think of him a little bit more jovial. Um, I think of him having the capability to get frustrated but um, always kind to his friends. And uh, so, I don't know, I'm going on a tangent here to avoid saying what I really think, but... Uh, uh, you know, I think there's a, yeah, there's a, there's a place for all kinds of different Mickeys. Um, I, celebrate all. I celebrate all Mickeys. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got time so, for one last question. So, I like the act voice actor that did Anakin Skywalker. I know you guys have bonded a lot throughout the entire series. How did that evolve for your relationship? Oh, that's a great question. Um, because when we record Star Wars and Clone Wars, we actually got to record as a cast. Um, so it's almost like an old radio drama back in the day, how they would come together and record as a cast. I feel very fortunate that we got to do the same thing. So, and we've been recording Star Wars and Clone Wars since 2006. Now, um, truly, that's why we've all become family. I mean, really, it's not even, it's past friendship, it's family at this point. And we've gotten to know each other so well. Because in some cases with voiceover, and a lot of cases with you, Brett, um, you record by yourself. So you're not with the other actors, you're just by yourself, and then you record your lines and go home. Um, but specifically with Matt Lanter, I'll tell y'all a funny story. Um, but so, Matt, and I talked about recasting in the beginning. There was a different Anakin Skywalker for the first six months. And uh, sadly, he was a very nice guy named Matt. Sadly, they felt that they, they wanted to go in a different direction with Anakin. And um, they were both named Matt, actually. The first <laughs> Anakin was named Matt. But then they brought in Matt Lanter. Well, I had already been recording Ahsoka for six months at this point. And I knew that, <laughs> that the relationship between Anakin and Ahsoka was, was purely pl platonic. Like it was just brother-sister. Um, because uh, something had been said and they were like, oh, a lot of people are going to want there to be a romantic relationship between Ahsoka and Anakin. And so literally, I met Matt. He was like, hi, nice to meet you. He had just come into the studio. And like the next thing out of my mouth was, um, just so you know, there's nothing going on here. <laughs> <laughs> and Matt like reminds me of that to this day. It's like, there's nothing going on here. <laughs> so yeah, we have a very, very close relationship. I'd like to add to that that I've met Matt at a dinner party, so. <laughs> Just saying. Um, and not to go back, I am going to go back to that last question because I just thought of something that I think is very important for me to say about my opinion of Mickey, the original. <laughs> if I may. Um, and I just, I actually just thought of this a couple weeks ago. And what is really important to me about whatever version of Mickey you're looking at is that 
Mickey is Walt Disney's Mickey. Um, a lot of times I hear other names attached to Mickey based on who worked on the project or whatever, but you know what? To me, Mickey is Walt, and that's the only thing that matters when defining Mickey Mouse. So, And also I had dinner with Matt Lanter, so. <laughs> well, that is a great way to end this. Um, thank you guys so much for coming to our Voice Your Dreams panel today, and welcome to our club! Hey.